not usually good. Now, Pluto is the most spiritual planet, most powerful planet. Pluto is intense. Pluto rules Scorpio, okay? Scorpio. It's, so Pluto is very intense. People that are Plutonian, first of all, it was said that Pluto is the higher octave of Mars because it rules Scorpio. They say that Uranus is the higher octave of Mercury. Mercury is the mind. Multiply the planet of the mind by 100 and you have Uranus. Multiply the planet Venus, which is love and beauty and art, multiply that times 100 and you have Neptune. Uranus is the higher Mercury, more intense Mercury, and Neptune is the more intense Venus. They have always said, because Pluto rules Scorpio, that Pluto is the higher octave of Mars. I don't think that's true. My first teacher, Isabel Hickey, a Western astrology teacher, said Pluto is the higher octave of the moon, of the moon. So it looks, Pluto, Pluto people seem very Marsy. They, some, you know, like the prisons are filled with Plutonian people, people with strong Plutos, because when they, when somebody hurts them, when somebody does something to them or somebody hurts them or something, they feel it so intensely, they're going to get that person back and they're going to be intense and they don't care about the rules. They're going to go after and do whatever they have to do. They wind up in prison. But Pluto is on one hand, um, this very, very intense aspect and it makes everything it touches. It makes compulsive, compulsive. So, if Mercury and Pluto are conjunct, the person's mind goes deep, 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 and they are compulsive about communication. If Pluto is with Venus, they are compulsive about love matters. They will be psychic with their marriage partner. They will have... Now, the other thing about Pluto is that Pluto represents, like Scorpio, so it's considered the planet of death and rebirth. So Pluto hits the sun and your father dies and you go through pain and then you are reborn. Pluto hits the sun and you're, you, 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 you know, something dies, some, something that you were attached to comes to an end, but then you're reborn stronger. So Pluto's a planet of death and rebirth any planet near Pluto becomes compulsive and intense and powerful, okay? Now, Pluto, because it's the higher moon, is a spiritual planet where you nurture people, you heal people. You take A person that wants to save the world is a Pluto person, usually. They want to heal the world. Scorpio energy, the healing energy, this extreme emotional, it's like very extreme deep emotion goes into Pluto. So Pluto in the first house, first of all, is spiritual. It's a spiritual influence. A healing, looking at the world in terms of a wholeness and healing. And the Pluto person, Pluto in the first house, the person can be very powerful but they can also be enormously sensitive, both. That's why it's like the higher octave of the moon. They're extremely sensitive and deep and profound. Um, and, they can, and they can also be what we call survivors. They can survive anything because they've got very strong power. Pluto in the second, so Pluto is gonna make a person do something big. So Pluto in the second house could make the person a multimillionaire. They would have such intense focus and compulsion for money. Pluto in the third house could give compulsion with brothers and sisters. It is a malefic, so it can be difficult for brothers and sisters, but it might be a brother or a sister who's changing the world, powerful. 
um, if it's in the Western chart, Pluto in the third house is the mind being very intense. Pluto in the fourth house, not very good for home life. It's too intense for the mother. The mother, Pluto is somewhat like Rahu. So if Rahu's in the fourth house, the mother may be smothering, intense, domineering. Pluto in the fourth house, the mother is intense, smothering, psychic with you, too strong of an attachment to you, like that. But if it's well aspected, it's wonderful for real estate. It's deep, deep, deep compulsion. Pluto next to Jupiter, the person does every, every, everything big. A planet next to, next to Pluto becomes compulsive. <clears throat> Pluto, Jupiter, the person's compulsive about religion, philosophy. Pluto, Venus, they are compulsive about love matters. Pluto, Mercury, compulsive about, about going deep into the intellect, like that. Um, Pluto Mars, the person can be ruthless. Mars will become compulsive and the person can be ruthless at going after what they want. But they can also be mechanical technical. It, 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 it makes them, it intensifies the planet that it touches. <clears throat> it intensifies the house it occupies. The fifth house is love affairs in the West. Pluto in the fifth house the person suffers on account of love affairs because there's too much energy, too much intensity in the fifth house, love affairs and stuff. But Pluto in the fifth house makes them compulsive to create, to be an artist, to, to be creative. Pluto in the fifth. Pluto in the sixth house, a healer. They can heal other people. Um, they can also have intense experiences with their bosses or with co-workers or things like that. Pluto in the seventh house, very difficult. <clears throat> if you have Pluto in the first house, you're going to go through so many emotional upheavals where you learn about yourself. Emotional upheavals, learning about yourself throughout life, death and rebirth, death and rebirth, death and rebirth. You feel like you're dying and then you feel great. You feel like you're dying, then you feel great. That's in the first house. In the seventh house, the marriage feels like it's dying, and then it gets reborn, and then it's dying, and then it gets reborn. So a person with Pluto in the seventh house is going to have so much evolution and growth from relationship through pain, through pain, through the intensity. Okay? Now they could also have a partner who's saving the world, who's spiritual and saving the world powerful. Pluto in the eighth house would be as astrological, psychic, metaphysical, things like that. Maybe something for banking. Maybe. Pluto in the ninth house, again, a lot of the people that come for astrology readings who are very spiritual have Pluto in the ninth house. They're compulsive about religion, philosophy, higher knowledge. They're compulsive about it. Um, and compulsive about traveling. Pluto in the 10th house, not so good for the father. The father may be intense or smothering. The father could also be dead or gone. You don't know. Pluto is a very intense influence. So it's, it, you don't want Pluto in the fourth. I, I wouldn't want Pluto in the angular houses, one, four, seven, and 10. I wouldn't want them. Um, Pluto in the 10th house can be good for a spiritual career, but it's probably not so good for the relationship with the father, unless it's very well aspected in the Western system. Pluto in the 11th house. So Nep Pluto is kind of like, with any of these Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, you do not have control of that house that it sits in for different reasons. Uranus, you have no control because it's up and down, up and down, up and down changes. Neptune is illusion, deception. You can't grab it. Pluto is this intense karmic influence. So you have no control where these planets are. That's why they create so much havoc. But if they're strong, they give the greatest powers of all, way more than Jupiter and Saturn. So it's, you know, 
um, to, to not, I mean, I understand that if you're using the ancient system, you don't use these planets. But I'm telling you, if, if I did a reading without using Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, I would be lost. There would be so much information missing. Now, I don't use it so much natally to talk about. I see it, and I make a mental note, oh, Neptune's in that house, that's, that's going to be a problem house. Then I'll find out where the problems are from the Hindu system. I won't even mention the Neptune, but I'll mention it because it'll be showing up somewhere in the Hindu system. But what you miss if you're not using Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto is when those planets transit a house and when they transit a planet. If Pluto hits your Venus, if Pluto hits your moon, if Uranus hits your sun, you can't ignore these things. They're huge, huge. So uh, Pluto um, through the 10th house is a time when, when it transits the 10th house. You may really want to, to heal the world do something you've never done before and, and, and spiritual, holistic, make a difference. People that want to make a difference in the world and change the world are Plutonian. When there's a very strong desire to change the world, there's almost, almost always a very strong Pluto. Uh, Pluto through the 12th house or Pluto in the 12th house, spiritual, but a lot of subconscious problems could be there could be there. Um, it's, some of these things are really fascinating to see. When you see a person with Pluto conjunct Venus, they may be very, very good at being psychic with a partner, at being very sexually talented. Um, they may have artistic talents and abilities. But Pluto-Venus people are so super sensitive when they experience pain that they make a decision, they make a decision that's too painful. From now on, I'm going to control my life so I never go through that pain. These people have a terrible life. They're constantly trying to control life because Pluto's with Venus. And you can't control life. It just makes you, it makes you age very fast and makes you nervous and tense. It's a very rough aspect. Pluto moon means the mother is smothering or the mother is too in, in, intense. If you have a Pluto Venus conjunction, your partner could be halfway around the world. And if something happens, you know it psychically. If Pluto is with the moon, you're connected to your mother and something happens to your mother, you know it. Something happens to you, she knows it. Pluto conjunct the sun is powerful leadership, leadership and power, but it could also be a father that's too intense or too smothering. So these are, you know, interesting. Okay, so the best book on Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, just those three planets, one of them is by Stephen Arroyo, A-R-R-O-Y-O, -R -R -O -O, Stephen Arroyo. And the book it was titled Astrology, Karma, and Transformation. The Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto planets, these are the planets that make a person jump to the spiritual world. People are living their lives and they think all that exists is what I can see, touch, taste, and feel. Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto are the planets of transformation. They, they boost you. They bring you up to the next level, which is the spiritual level. So Astrology, Karma, and Transformation is the best one book on those three planets. Um, my book, uh, How to Be a Great Astrologer, is just those aspects. There's also, I have a book called How to Predict Your Future, Secrets of Eastern and Western Astrology. That's Western transits. So you could see Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto transiting through the signs and houses, or through the houses, I should say and you would see what they do when they conjunct planets. And you don't have to, you don't have to use these in the Hindu system. You can just you know, get a Western chart, take those planets, you're gonna see the conjunctions, you're gonna see the squares and oppositions. If you read my book, it'll, it'll explain what those aspects are, and you will get extra information that you would not otherwise get. I have, I have people, 
that have read all my books, the Hindu astrology and the advanced Hindu, and they like this one the most because they can pick an aspect anywhere and read it to somebody, and the person goes, oh, my God. There's like a page on every aspect. And if a person has a strong aspect, that you read that book and you go, oh, my God, that's really that person. Um, but that's, that's the... Uh, that's the only book that I know of that is specifically on the out, outer planets. Okay. My God. <laughs> well, I started with I started with Western astrology. And you See, ended. <laughs> so Uranus hit my seventh house cusp, and the marriage exploded. So then I went to a different astrologer, Isabel Hickey, and she, she saw Uranus had hit the cusp. So the first thing she said is, there's nothing you can do because Uranus is outside of your control. It breaks things up. She said, it doesn't matter what you say, doesn't matter what you do, it's all in your wife's hands because Uranus hit. Now she saw that Uranus was gonna come back and hit, come back three or four months later and hit the cusp again. She said, when that hits again, she'll be back. And that's exactly what happened. She came back when Uranus hit again. That's one of the interesting things about these very slow moving transits of Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. If Uranus or Pluto hits a cusp, an, an event happens, or it hits a planet, an event happens, then it moves on its way. But then when it backs up and hits again, the same issue comes back. And then it goes forward, hits again for a third time, hits the last time, then it's over. But if it hits two or three times, the first time it lets you know the event, the second and third time you get to deal with it again. So look for my books on eBooks, the art, not yet, but the art and practice of ancient Hindu astrology should be on eBook in uh, probably mid-December 2018 this year. And then uh, the other ones I'll get on, you know, as the months go by, I'm going to get the other ones on eBooks as well. And my Living Reality book, which is a, a book on Advaita, Sailor Bob, the spiritual book, that's now on eBook. I got that. That's the... That's on eBooks now. This is um, this was my experience with Sailor Bob. He was an Advaita teacher, and he came to my house for five weeks, and gave. He came to my house for five weeks, and gave classes. He was a student of Nisargadatta Maharaj in India, and. Um, he was a teacher of Nisargadatta Maharaj in India. But, well, actually, first he had gone to see Muktananda. And he was studying in the ashram and doing the meditations and the mantras and the yoga. And he, he, you know, he, left, he left Australia. He said, I'm, I'm not coming home again until I gain enlightenment. I'm leaving. I'm going to India, and I'm not coming home. Eventually, he heard about Nisargadatta, and he went to see Nisargadatta. And that's when he you know, his spiritual path came to an end. So he started teaching the same Advaita. And then I invited him to my house and he came for five weeks in 2004. So that's now on eBooks as well. Okay, so it's been my pleasure. Namaste. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm and and, and invite me again and we'll have another session. Find me some horoscopes. Find me some horoscopes that you want to look at and analyze, whether it's people you know, or um or famous people and we'll analyze them yes 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 thank you very much once again yeah and one more thing uh, you have the website and you also do readings i do so i'll pin James, the jamesbraha.com is my website uh or you can email me at jamesbraha at gmail.com i do readings they are uh 70 to 90 minutes long and i record the session and they're extremely thorough. It's the natal chart, the dashas and muktis, the gemstones, and then Hindu transits for four years, Western transits for two or three years, and the dashas, you know, for 
five, 10 years or longer sometimes. All right, then. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Again for coming. Thank you. <laughs> it's been bye so bye. long. Okay. Thank you.